Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Alan Parr just did a video on predestination. So in this video, I'm going to respond to what he said. Here's how he describes double predestination in his introduction. What we're talking about in this video, if you want to study it up a little further, is actually a doctrine called double predestination. Or more specifically, it's talking about the two theological doctrines, the first being election. And election is this idea that God arbitrarily chooses some people before the world was created to be saved. But then on the flip side, there is this doctrine called reprobation. And this is the idea that God chooses to pass over selecting certain people, thus leaving them in their sins, which means they will not be saved. Now, first of all, I downloaded the text for this video, and I didn't see one time where he used the word Calvinism. But that's essentially what he's talking about here. In Calvinism, the elect are saved and the non-elect aren't. And as he said, it's an arbitrary choice on God's part. Some are chosen for salvation for whatever reason, and others end up in hell because God passed them by for some mysterious purpose that only he knows. Most Calvinists prefer to identify themselves as Reformed, or maybe they just say that they hold to the doctrines of grace. But a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And bad theology by any other name is still bad theology. Allen goes on to lay down several premises. And in premise number five, he says that we shouldn't use logic. Premise number five, please refrain from using logic to come to whatever decision or conclusion or position that you have. Listen, God is not logical. He is theological, right? Which means... Some of the things that he does does not make sense to us. So don't say, well, that doesn't make sense, or that's not fair, or no, God would have done it this way, or no, this doesn't make No, don't use logic, use scripture. Now, one of the arguments that apologists use for God is that God is rational. And since we're created in his image, we are also rational beings. The Apostle Paul said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans 1, 18 through 21. So Paul is making an argument here that man should be able to look at God's creation and conclude that there is a God and that he reigns over his creation. So man's ability to reason is assumed in this argument. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1.18 So again, it's assumed that man has the capacity for reason and is called upon to use that ability. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there, Acts 17, 16, and 17. So Paul reasoned in the synagogues and in the market, which means that he assumed that the Jews and the Greeks had the capacity to use logic. So how is it that we're suddenly being told that logic has no place in this discussion? Allen's premise is that we can't inject our understanding of justice into this equation because it simply doesn't apply here. But I reject that. I think we have every right to challenge God's justice if he sends people to hell because they just did what he decreed that they would do and weren't given the ability to repent or have saving faith by God's decree. Alan goes on to present the free will view and provide proof text for that position. Position number one, God does not predestine some people to heaven and some people to go to hell. 
No, that is foolish. This is the primary position of the Armenians, right? This is the idea of free will. Everyone has free will. Everyone has the same opportunity to be saved. And let me give you several scriptures that support this particular position. Of course, Armenians are people who live in Armenia. Alan meant Arminians, people who hold to the five points of Arminianism. Human free will, conditional election, universal atonement, resistible grace, and falling from grace. Allen then provides this argument against free will. That's some strong support. Anyone and everybody can be saved, but there's a huge problem with this particular view, and that's the fact that if you really subscribe to this and only this, then you're really setting up this idea that a person's salvation largely depends on them. It is their responsibility to be saved. In other words, I can be in heaven and I can say, you know what, I am here because I was wise enough, I was intelligent enough, I was smart enough to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. When the gospel was presented to me, I made a choice. And because I was smart enough and wise enough to figure out this is a pretty good deal, I can get forgiven for all my sins and spend eternity with God. But my neighbor who sat, uh, was in, in the house next to me, they weren't smart enough to do it. They did not make that choice. Now, this is a dumb argument. I'm not saying that Alan is dumb because he didn't come up with this argument. It's been around forever in the Reformed world. Alan is just invoking it. But it makes about as much sense as saying that a man in a burning building could brag about having enough sense to jump into a safety net provided by the fireman rescuing him. Or a drowning man could brag about having enough sense to grab a lifeline thrown to him by somebody rescuing him. Would you brag in that situation? Or would you just hug the people who rescued you and thank them? You see, this is all a part of Calvinism's attempt to define faith as a work. And we're not saved by works. But faith isn't a work. Faith is contrasted with works in Scripture repeatedly. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Galatians 2, 15 and 16. Everything needed for our salvation was done by God through Jesus' substitutionary work. All that is required of us is that we believe. So what is there to brag about? Alan then goes on to provide the proof texts for predestination. Proverbs 16.4 says the Lord has prepared everything for his purpose. Here it is, even the wicked for the day of disaster. Wow. Notice that it doesn't say that God made them wicked. It says that he made the wicked. God uses evil for his purposes, but he doesn't create evil. When God created man, man was good. Everything that God created was originally good. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Genesis 1.31 when man fell into sin and condemnation, God used that to display his grace before all of his creation. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Now, if you filter everything through the lens of determinism, you can interpret Proverbs 16.4 as God creating evil people just so that he can cast them into hell. But that's not consistent with what the Bible reveals about the character of God. That's what I was referring to earlier when I said that we have to use reason. 
Alan's position seems to be that when you find verses that seem to say that God is a jerk and a celestial sadist, you just have to accept that, even if it doesn't make sense. But that's not what the text is saying when you view it in the light of all the verses about God's goodness, his love, his patience, his justice, and his mercy. They stumble because they disobey the word they were destined for this. Wow. They were destined for this. <laughs> they were destined, they were predetermined to stumble over the word of God or stumble over Christ. Same thing here. They weren't destined to stumble until they disobeyed the word. Again, this isn't a reference to the predestination of their choices or actions. It's a reference to hell and the eternal destiny of those who make those choices and commit those acts. So Alan is filtering all of these proof texts through a lens that presents God as punishing people for doing what they were predestined to do. And if we don't like it, we're just supposed to lump it because after all, God is God and he doesn't have to justify anything that he does. Next, Alan goes to the favorite passage of Calvinists in Romans 9. And not only that, but Rebecca conceived children through one man, our father Isaac, for though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to election might stand not from works, but from the one who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Now, this passage is supposedly saying that God chose Jacob for salvation and Esau for damnation. But if you look at the passage in its proper context, it's not talking about salvation. It's talking about Israel being chosen as God's covenant people. Jacob, who was renamed Israel, was given preference over his brother Esau in establishing a nation who would be entrusted with the law and would bring the Savior into the world. The whole chapter is about Israel. To read this as God predestined that Jacob would go to heaven and Esau would go to hell is to misread the entire narrative. Paul is explaining the revelation that he was given, that Israel was given the covenant but through unbelief and disobedience, the message of salvation came to the Gentiles through faith. He continues that theme for several chapters. So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. Underline that, look at it again, reread it. It does not depend on human will. See, salvation does not depend on our human effort, our human will, but on who? God who has mercy. Right. Our will and effort to keep the law or earn salvation don't save us. God's mercy saves us. But that doesn't mean that we don't have free will and the ability to exercise faith in order to receive the free gift of salvation. Again, Alan is reading these Calvinism proof texts through a deterministic lens. What are we to do with all the verses that say, whosoever? What about all the verses that tell us to choose life, choose salvation, choose to follow Jesus? Are you going to just nullify them because our will is irrelevant according to Romans 9.16? Alan goes on to try to explain predestination in a way that gets God off the hook by putting the blame on people who choose to reject him. But in doing so, he contradicts what he's already laid out about free will. He then presents this analogy. Let me paint this picture for you. Let's just say you're at an airport and this airline decides to give away 60 tickets to people to go to Hawaii. And they randomly choose 60 people who are at the airport that day and give them free tickets, all expense paid trip to Hawaii. Now, is that airline wrong for not selecting certain people? No, it's their right to choose. They don't have to give any tickets away, right? They don't have to give anyone anything, but the fact that they were gracious enough to give away 60 tickets to an all expense, uh, all inclusive resort vacation to Hawaii, that's mercy. That's grace. My friends, that's exactly what God has decided to do with regards to salvation. <laughs> okay, the problem with the analogy should be obvious. 
The airline didn't predestine the vast majority of customers to eternal flames. According to Calvinism, God ordained the fall and then chose to only extend saving faith to a minority called the elect, which means that he ordained that billions of people would be born into this world where they would inevitably sin and fall under condemnation with no means of salvation because Jesus didn't die for them and they weren't given saving faith. In what universe is that remotely like an airline giving out free plane tickets to Hawaii? Alan wraps it up with this. I believe in election. I believe the Bible makes it very clear that God does choose some people before the foundation of the world to be saved in his mercy, in his grace. That's his business. By default, I believe that that means God also chooses to pass over other people. Notice I didn't say that he predestines them to go to hell. He decides to pass over some people and leave them in their sin, which is ultimately what they want to do. They want God to leave them alone. So God says, I will leave them alone. So here's my bottom line, and this is where I land. If you are a believer and you are part of the elect, thank God. Just spend your life thanking God that he has chosen you. Well, you can thank God and be grateful for the free gift of eternal life without buying into Calvinism. You can be thankful without making God into a monster who is so sick that he, in essence, burns down an entire hotel so that he can be glorified by saving a few people in it. The idea that God would predestine anybody to hell before they're born without providing atonement for their sins and without enabling them to exercise saving faith when they hear the gospel is totally inconsistent with the God of the Bible. In Luke 14, Jesus told the parable of the Great Supper. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Luke 14, 16 through 24. Do you see any predestination there? I sure don't. I see a God who created a beautiful place called heaven and invites everybody to come. And the only people who won't be allowed in are those who turn down the invitation. I see free will. I see a God who wants his house filled and only rejects those who reject him. Alan Parr has nearly 1 million subscribers. He's a great marketer, and he's doing a lot of things right from a business standpoint, but he's giving people a skewed view of the character of God, and he's not the only one. Many YouTube theologians and apologists do that, even those who claim to reject Calvinism. This is a big part of what motivates me to do what I do. God is good. God is just. God is merciful. God is gracious. He isn't willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And those of us who see him that way need to make our voices heard. If you got something out of this, I'd like to ask you to comment below, like, share, and subscribe to help me with the algorithm. Thanks for watching, everybody, and be blessed.